to and um, and just over to you because um, I just think that what you're going to tell us is interesting. I've read up on it and um, I'm sure that our members will really enjoy your presentation. So thank you for being with us this morning. Well, Diana, thank you so much for having me here. I'm delighted. I'm afraid it's not a presentation. It really is more of a post Rosh Hashanah shambles, mother of for um, trying to juggle everything chat. Um, that's all I really can cope with at the moment. But I'm so happy to be asked always to speak to anyone in the Jewish community because when I do, I think about my grandmother, Celia Raffaele, who did so much amazing work for so many years through the U Union of Jewish Women Flower Group. And I really hope she would be proud of me um, and tickled pink that anyone was interested in listening to me. Um, she was yeah. such a wonderful grandmother. Well, and yes, a story. Anyway, listen, um, <clears throat> are you doing Please anything to yourselves, today? everybody? Sorry about that. Am I, am I presenting or am I... Um, chatting I, I'm not you sure. just chat but i'm going to mute everybody yeah okay. they're all muted now yeah but okay. just let me know when you're ready for me to start no i am ready uh, oh, are you okay cool but anyway back to the wonderful steely um who was an absolutely amazing grandmother um she thought each one of all of her many grandchildren was a genius of unparalleled talent and value um, and so I think she would have been very chuffed to know that um, Jewish community was interested to hear what we had, any of us had to say. I mean, I must add that she needed very little evidence of any of these alleged gifts to continue to believe, but Jewish grandmothers and grandfathers, as we know, are the best. Where would any of us be without them and without all of you? Um, I also think back to one of my um, ancestors, my great grandfather, Wolf Harris, who in fact in 1890 was sent out to Cape Town from Poland, he was only 17 years old, by his mother and starving family to try and find his own father who had disappeared into the desert in the northwestern Cape and of whom there had been no word for at least six months. Mm -hmm. um, he arrived with six pence in his pocket and, and was given a guinea um, by a kind English guy on, on the on the boat, that was it. He was 17 years old, couldn't speak a word of English and arrived with um, the instruction to get on a train and go as far north as he could and find some Jews. Um, what it took and what kind of a person could do that, I don't know. If I look at my own children who all hover around that age group, the oldest is 21, the youngest is 15. Um, I know they certainly couldn't get to um, Plettenberg Bay alone without help. So um, he managed all of this and arrived at the end of the train line and set off for the unknown asking for Jews as he went. That was the instruction that he'd got. And thanks to the fact that there were a few Jewish traders in the Northern Cape at the time, the fact that these people, no matter how far flung they were, made to form a, form a minion every few weeks meant he was able to reunite with his father. I mean, what an incredible achievement. Um, and then he, because the two of them could then work together, they were able to make a, a bit of a living, scrape together a living, get the rest of the family out. And he actually went on to be a great pillar of the community, Wolf Harris, for many, many years. Um, I also have another incredible grandfather, Leo Raffaele, who was a truly fascinating man. Um, he was a maverick and extremely determined. He was a cat who walked by himself, um, who saw the writing on the wall for the Jews in Europe way before most. Um, after years of hammering away at resistance in this community from the Jewish community, who it seems feared that more Jewish immigrants would make their own lives harder. He, um, and also fighting against the government and the general public's anti-Semitism, he managed to and fought for and sponsored European Jews to flee to South Africa for years before the world actually realized that this was a necessity. Um, he even opened an, uh, an office in London to facilitate this. 
And eventually, before the outbreak of the war, he got news that there was a ship with 545 souls on it that needed safe harbor anywhere. Um, this was the Stuttgart. Um, maybe it's familiar to some of you. The government, many of the Jewish community and local Nazis, the gray ships, were finally all absolutely against it coming here. Um, and legend has it that my grandmother, Judith, um, whose name was Monty, was friends with General Smuts's wife at the time, and she actually went on on her knees to beg to try um, for help and support um, to get to allow them. And they were in the end allowed to bring them in so long as each and every soul on board had um, surety stood for them. So he teamed up with Jacob Gitlin and the two of them knocked on every door they could, begging people to, Jewish people to join, to stand surety for each person on board. Um, and in the end, he and Gitlin carried most of the cost themselves. And it was a sum that would have bankrupted him many times over if he were ever asked to redeem it. But the Stuttgart ended up being one of the last boats carrying Jews away from Germany to find safe refuge anywhere. And the next year an act was passed in the South African parliament making immigration impossible. Um, so while I'm here to talk about my own career and business, I stand in the shadows of um, men and women that I consider absolutely great. So um, they're very big shoes to fill. But my generation and my parents' generation have been extremely lucky um, coming from these humble beginnings. Um, both ourselves, my, my siblings and I, my cousins um, and our own children have had the finest educations in South Africa and abroad from community as well as um, private and government schools. Now my daughter studies fine art at UCT. My son starts at Edinburgh um, studying engineering next year. Um, my husband and I have run successful, still run, so I have run and still, still run successful businesses and our wider family is similarly blessed. We've, we are so proud to say that we have graduates of UCT, Columbia, NYU, the LSE and RCA amongst our number. I often wonder what my great grandparents would think of us um, living the way we do. And um, again, I hope they would look at us with some pride, not necessarily for achievement, but for values. Um, I can't, as we, are, we believe we are a family that values, where values and, and morals and principles are extremely important to each and every one of us. Um, one of them, of course, is education. As you can see, my poor father, who paid for me to graduate with the PP, graduate with the PPE all those years ago, often used to say, did I really spend all that money for you to write cover lines about lipstick and dating? Well, for years and years and years, I worked in women's media, um, Good Housekeeping, Oprah, Cosmo, Marie Claire, to name but a few. And I can tell you that lipstick and dating definitely sold magazines. And back then, magazines were the fuel that bought the business that occupied most of my working life for 15 30 years, 30 whole years. These days, my father wouldn't be able to tell you what I did for a living, but Diana said you all might be interested, so let me let you know. Um, I'm 56. When I turned 50, I suppose I had something of an epiphany, which was that I had realized, I realized that I was working for a machine and to feed a hungry machine and for people my entire career. I started off in newspapers in London at 20. I worked on Fleet Street when we still had manual typewriters, three hour liquid lunches, that was the good bit, and a thick fog of cigarette smoke in every office. We got to work at nine and left at six and had those lunches in between. A lot of it was really fun, more fun than hard. Um, but it was, and, but it also was quite tough. I mean, I was a South African person, a little South African provincial girl in, um, in London by myself in a quite dog-eat-dog -dog world of Fleet Street at the time. But um, I still managed to survive. I don't know how. I'm, I really am not sure whether I would have backed me or employed me at that time. In fact, maybe they wanted to get rid of me because one of the biggest jobs that I did was I wrote a series of, um, of, a series of pieces for the Sunday Express called The Intrepid Girl Reporter when my editor basically tried to kill me. Um, I jumped out of planes, I Paris skied, I bungee jumped, I went up in a tornado three and a half times the speed of sound. Um, 
my, my mother and grandmother, of course, were mortified. My sister checked to see who were the beneficiaries of my insurance policies, discovered they were, it was her and, and um, my other siblings, and that it was in pounds, even great at the time, and then encouraged me to continue throwing myself out of planes. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't all that though. I left the world of newspapers after working for two, two of the most feared women in the business. One, um, Lynn Barber was nicknamed the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, to give you an idea. So I learned at, again, once again, great privilege to learn in the shadow of really accomplished, um, tough and um, determined people. But leaving Fleet Street, I seemed to follow the path of least resistance, born as I often joke into a breeding program for women's media journalists. There is of course my mother, my sister, my aunt Carolyn, who um, started off funny enough, who, who has had periods as a women's magazine journalist. She's now much better known for her work um, for the Justice Project. Um, Rosie Benjamin, my aunt as well, was a lifestyle journalist. Um, so yeah, I just did what I was bred for and moved to Cosmopolitan UK. And that magazine was a monster at the time. We regularly sold over 700,000 copies a month. I mean, it's hard to imagine another great school of real life and business. But, um, but by 28, 28, I guess my buzzing brain, I, I'm actually a sucker to an idea, not always a good one, even a bad one will do it for me. Um, my brain came up with the idea of a health and beauty magazine and I launched Zest for Hearst in, UK, in the UK. Um, what a dream come true. And um, how lucky, really lucky to be that person was, gifted that. Um, it's also a dream to um, make all your first mistakes as a rookie on someone else's dime. Again, I don't know if I would have backed me, but um, it was brilliant living the dream in London, in 90s London, um, looking at what our life, my life was like versus what my children's life was like. The freedom, the travel, the um, entertainment, the stimulation, the ease of it all. Um, it seems truly, truly unfair. But even then, after three years editing Zest and after the first democratic election back home, the UK began to feel less and less like home. And home I came, excuse me. So by 30, I was back in Cape Town with my nice Jewish homeboy in my jaws. <coughs> And for the next 20 years, my mother, my sister, and I ran Associated Media. <coughs> Sorry, not COVID, it's painting. My house is being painted. Um, I also became stepmom to a daughter, mother to three of my own. We acquired another semi detached child along the way. What a ride. Um, during that time in women's media and women's magazines, we launched and ran Oprah in partnership with the amazing Miss Winfrey for 10 whole years. We had partnerships with Hearst and album Marie Claire. Um, I myself edited Cosmo for all that time, then became creative director of the magazine, navigated the change into digital and, and loved it. I think in many ways, digital is really my, my medium. Um, and we had a whole collection of successes and failures. Um, the successes, of course, were nicer than the failures. Um, I'm not going to lie, earning a lot of money is a really nice feeling until the party stopped. So the demise of magazines took a while, but I have to say I did see it coming. And luckily for me, my own wake up call came at a time when I had both fallen out of love with the business and when I could still sell my shares in the company for enough money to take the time to find out what my third act would be. Um, and it takes a while to figure out what you're gonna do after the music stops, um, especially if you've been on a whirlwind of mothering and, um, mothering and working and building a business and maintaining a business and managing. At that point, Associate was an absolute beast. It was 180 people. It was a massive print bill, a massive distribution bill a massive staff um, pay, um, payroll. And um, 
the interesting thing about popping out of your own business old, but too young to retire, is that I soon discovered that no one wants to hire you. I was absolutely unemployable. Um, this is not to say I didn't do stuff during this time when I was trying to figure out what next I did. Um, I worked in TV for a while, um, came up with a couple of concepts which did make it to TV, but discovered reality TV was not for me. I wrote two children's books about a warthog, one of my favorite things still ever I've ever done and a novel, um, also a, an amazing achievement that for me, that was published by Pan Macmillan. It was a huge dream, a bucket list ticked off, but um, I made the big mistake of writing sex scenes, um, which my then 16 year old son read next to me as we were um, parked on the tarmac at um, ORT airport. Um, one of the most embarrassing and mortifying moments of my life. So I won't be doing that again. Um, I also wrote journalism for a lot of titles, both here and abroad. I traveled and I actually just spun my wheels in the mud, wondering what next, what, what I could do next. And um, looking back now, that walk in the self-esteem desert when no one is taking my calls, everyone I thought were just opportunistic suck-ups, actually really proved themselves that they were and that they wanted nothing to do with me now that I was no longer of use to them. That period was really good for me. Um, it was time for me to catch up with myself and let me know, let the real me actually come to the fore. When you've been producing content for an audience and have had powerful partners for your whole working life, you know, who you, can, who you are yourself can be suppressed. So after a while of wondering, my true self did emerge, and it appeared she wanted to start a sorbet for teeth in shopping malls across the country. Um, I did say I was an ideas person, not a good ideas person necessarily. So while planning this business, this is my plan, was oral hygiene and teeth whitening in every mall. Um, I thought how convenient it would be for moms, busy moms, while they went shopping, they, they could dump their kids to have their teeth cleaned. Um, for people who are going to a business meeting, they could have their teeth cleaned beforehand for confidence. Anyway, I thought about teeth and orifices a lot, and I was very excited by all of this. But I also wondered how I was going to tell my prospective clients, customers, about this brilliant business idea of mine. Um, I knew the traditional media was broken, and I knew also that I could not afford to pay what, for the advertising that was available then. Um, so I figured, me being me, I figured I would do it myself. And I thought I would start a community of potential customers on social media myself. I thought I can gather moms, working women, single women, and then I could market my great tooth business to them directly. But I needed something to gather, cause them to gather around me in significant numbers. And at this point, my teenage children were in the eye of the teenage storm. They were really, really not put on this planet to make me look like parents of the year. And I realized there was no one anywhere um, and there was nothing around offering any help. Plenty of help for babies, but you know, um, babies are not even entry level with regard to difficulty in comparison to teenagers. So the village was born and this was a supportive and positive community invested in making the future better for all of our families. I allowed no argument, no judgment, no cruelty, no trolling. I launched it thinking if it got to 2000 people, it would be brilliant. And that would be great as a gang of um, ambassadors for my, for my teeth business. Um, but it just exploded. It started at 200 of my friends and Within a week, it was at 2,000 and then 20,000. And its members absolutely loved it. And they loved each other. And they continue to be lovely towards each other. They still join in their thousands, um, excuse me, um, in unprecedented numbers. And they engage. 95% of them are active on the group every month. But it was so much a side hustle for some weird reason. At this point in my life, I'm still obsessed with teeth. So. I reached out to an ex-boyfriend who is um, a venture capitalist for some advice on raising money for the teeth idea. And he sighs and puts his head in his hands and says, 
What do you know about teeth? What do you know about retail? Are you an oral hygienist? Do you want to be standing in a shopping mall all day? Do you want your head down someone's smelly mouth all day? And the penny drops. And I sit down and think to myself, oh my goodness, this is not for me. And what can I do if not teeth? And um, this ex-boyfriend of mine looks at the trajectory of the village's growth and says, you know, the only route, route to success, to pure success, is the spot in the Venn diagram when you do something better than anyone else and it's something that everyone wants. V, look at the village, that's your thing. And he raised an eyebrow at me, paid for our coffee and went back to Palo Alto. And you know, he was right. The village, the weird little beast that it is, was a pure creation which reflected a genuine and honest need and the genuine expression and the values and limited skills of its creator. When I said I was unemployable, I'm not lying. I can only do a few things very, very well. So it turned out to be the most amazing gift to me in my third act. The village now has 42,000 followers, still growing, has not, still has a 95% engagement. I reject 35% of people who want to join it. It's the Google of essay parenting. It's the kind Google of essay parenting. It's a space where people, no matter what color, creed, religion, help each other with open hearts and nothing but kind wishes for, um, for others in the same boat that they're in. I'm not lying when I say um, miracles happen on that village every day. In the last month or two, we've brought back a terminally ill man from Vietnam to spend his last months with his mom. We have paid for reading glasses for smart children who can now see the board at their schools. We've got computers to promising that's got the struggling students. We've paid off school fees for, for families in so much distress this year that they wouldn't have been able to allow their children to matriculate. We've even got a scholarship for a future young black male psychologist. His entire, um, his entire um, degree is paid for. The list goes on. It's something that gives me so much pride um, more than anything else I've ever really done in my life. I've discovered that Celie was right, that giving um, is the greatest gift that you can give yourself. But like I said, I was too young to retire and the village could not become some sort of NPO. It, it also became the little publishing gem I hoped it would too, as soon as I clicked that I had some, and I'd actually created a job for myself. I now have partnerships with Old Mutual, First for Women, Prestige Foods, the Irish government, Corycraft, Environ, amongst many others. I even have a village digizine, FOMO. You can't take magazines out of the girl. I now have the business that appeared I couldn't have dreamed of. The village has no staff, no rent, no stock, no risk, no VC. Imagine if I'd gone into the tooth thing as COVID struck. I would have been roadkill. But as it turned out, the village has exploded through COVID and by the middle of next year, I estimate I'll be earning more doing my own genuine thing, doing good than I earned when I had a staff of 180 and overheads which keep me, kept me awake and terrified for years. And I'm also, funny enough, not so, I am not one of those people who believes doing good is enough. While philanthropy is a core pillar, it actually, one could say it is the core pillar of my business. I'm also, it's not enough for me. As Jane and Michael Raffaele's daughter too, I hold equally dear the notion that professionals should be respected and rewarded for their endeavor. So to sum up, I consider myself uniquely blessed looking back over my three different careers. All of them have been rewarding, empowering, stimulating, enriching and fun. I thought I couldn't ask for more than that until I stumbled on this, my last career. This one that allowed me to work when I want, for whom I want, how I want, and doing what I want, while making a positive contribution to the universe and earning a living too. I'm really not sure it gets better for a Jew. And I think my great grandparents would be proud of me. And that gives me enormous pleasure too. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Vanessa. That was really fascinating. I'd, I'm sure that there are people that, that have a question for you, and I have two that I would like to ask. Um, the first one is, 
Um, how do you decide when you don't want people to come onto the village? What makes you turn them down? Um, it's actually very easy because the wonderful thing about creating a business out of Facebook is that people write their own Facebook pages. So um, one of the issues for us is privacy. And so we don't allow, funny enough, we do not allow teenagers or young adults into the village. We also don't allow people who um, use social media to engage aggressively or negatively. We don't allow any, any, any evidence of bullying or trolling and um, or kind of just mischief. I will, and I and my part-time assistant will, um, re will refuse, but we check every single um, person who applies and we are rigorous because the most important thing I find is that people come into the group with the same desire, which is not to cause trouble and not to um, indulge in all the terrible things that people do on social media groups, but actually come in with the same set of values and hopes that we, all 42,000, the 42,000 that are on the village already have shared for all this time. And it seems to work because um, I, I still, I think I could count the amount of people I've had to throw off on my fingers and toes. So that's wonderful that, that it's a minimal amount. Yeah. Tiny, and, tiny. Yeah. And the other question is, obviously it's philanthropic, but it comes from, from the people who are viewers or are participants in the group. Um, and, and that obviously comes voluntarily. So if you have a, a request for something or you hear about a need for someone, then you, um, do, you do you put it out there and, and wait for them to, to, for you to get a response? Um, it's such a wonderful feeling, darling. You know, people often ask how I can deal with some of the, with the very sad stories, and especially through this last period when our country has been so battered. Um, they wonder how I can deal. I, I load two, over 2,000 posts a month, and people ask me how I can deal with so much sadness and so much need. And, and the answer is that if you have belief that there will be help on the other side it's an uplifting process because now i know that no matter what i ask <clears throat> someone somewhere in our forty-two thousand strong community will have something to offer to make a difference to the person who's asking it's not a magic wand it's not possible to sort out people's lives but the, the issue what, what i've discovered is that sometimes even the smallest piece of acknowledgement or help or advice can really unlock something and more importantly, make a person feel they're not alone. The most common um, word I hear about when people are describing the village is that they say it makes them feel they're not alone, that there are people that can help. And the most beautiful thing about that is when you have 42,000 people and it's a very democratic collection of people, there are people who are, have so much in our community and there are people who have very little. Um, the least connected person is as connected as the most connected person on the village, if that makes sense. So again, like over the years, we've got people into seeing specialist doctors. We've had dental work done in a hurry if needed. We've been able to do what someone who is privileged could do for people who do not have access to that privilege. And that's been amazing. So that's really incredible. And do you find that pe most people who, who join up to come onto the village are either young moms or people, children, or is it across the board, any adults? You know, we started off and all I really wanted to do was help parents with teenagers because I mean, I've never had, I don't know if anyone agrees, you guys are all kind of more experienced than, than me, not much, but more. Um, I would say those period, that age when your children are 16 to 17 is the darkest, most terrifying of your life, and particularly now. But, um, you know, as something grows, it's grown. And we, um, we have many grandparents on the village. We have not so many who aren't parents, because I think that is the USP and that's what it is about. It is about families, but we have people who work with children. Um, we have a broader um, membership base, but what we will never have is the kids themselves because it's a question of privacy. 
um, you just do not want, you have to be careful if you're talking about another human being and if you are asking for help about them. So um, it really, it's, it's sort of, it, it, it will never be teenagers. But for the rest, it's definitely broadened out. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say um, about the helping, and, and that is what has been the most amazing of all is that I've been able to leverage the commercial relationships into proper health. So a lot of our partners, like Old Mutual and First for Women um, and many of the others, their reason for partnering with us is because they want to be part of a positive story and they want and they love the, um, the, the goals and values of the group. And so that ability to be able to use myself as a connection between someone in need, say for example, the kids who needed computers this year and a computer company and be able to put the two together has also been absolutely incredible. So it's also been a collaboration and a change of thinking between a publisher and, and an um, advertiser, for example. Because a lot of the time our barter um, exposure and help for um, for help for someone in need, as opposed to just payment, and that's been fantastic. It puts the biggest smile on my face. Wonderful, yeah. Are there any questions or any comments that anyone would like to to make? Unmute yourself, and 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 you're welcome to speak. Uh, good morning, Vanessa. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I can, uh, I can. Uh, so I'm a member of the village thank and you. often quote you. <laughs> oh, got a number you. of grandchildren ranging from little to teenage and it's been so helpful. I've learned so much. I am quoting you all the time. I think I've tried to make others members too. <laughs> so thank you have so succeeded much. in so well, but really... I, I watch, I tune in, should I say, to the village every day. And uh, I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> I really have benefited in so many ways. I can't even begin to tell you. So even as a grandmother, it's your village is incredibly helpful Thank from you all so different much. angles. I love to hear comments like that, but I want to say one thing is it's the beauty of a community like this is that it's not me, you know, I worked for Oprah, with Oprah for years and she, she earns and owes and owns her right to quote to be quoted and to opine, but the amazing thing about the village is it's the collective wisdom of all the amazing people who are on it, and that's what makes it powerful, I mean I genuinely just think that I sometimes just steer it. But um, what I think is the real richness of it is the learned experience and sharing. I mean, human beings are so happy when we are in communities. We are supposed to be sitting around a fire at the end of our working day, sharing our experiences, you know, gossiping, um, asking for advice. We're supposed to be listening to our elders. We're supposed to be sharing with our peers. And um, th those kind of communities are not functional at the moment. In South Africa, we don't have village squares. We don't have places where we all gather and kind of connect. But I do like to think of the village as a kind of village square. And that, and, and that for me is it's all the collective wisdom that makes it so powerful. Um, and, and thank you for being one of those, um, one of those making a contribution to that. So Sybil, maybe you could give us a couple of examples of where you've you've actually benefited or what you've been able to pass on to your family from being on the village, if you'd like to, if you feel comfortable to do that. Um, yes. For example, um, there was a parent whose child was going off to study overseas and asked a number of questions about the vaccination, the way to get it, would it be possible? They're under 18. Um, they were leaving before September the 1st. And I contacted that one lady who had had success and I contacted her via Messenger, first time I've ever used Messenger in that way. And, and I was able to get the information from her. And people are so kind and helpful in wanting to share the information. So that's one example. Um, there are many others. Um, 
just in the way people talk to their grandchildren, uh, to their children. Um, you know, I grew up in a different era where we handle things differently. It's a new generation and people speak differently and handle things differently. So I just feel I've learned a lot. I can't think of another example right now. Oh, well, maybe I can for this morning. There was one, uh, there was an um, insert about a woman who's domestic uh, or helper had been stealing from her. And I've had to deal with something similar. And I, I was very grateful for the way people responded to that. She was obviously upset and didn't know quite how to handle it. But there seem to be some legal people on your team who give really good advice about the CCMA or whatever it's called. And um, so things like that, it doesn't always relate to the teenager or the children. It's broader than that. You've now encompassed so many more subjects. It's the desire to make the future better for all of our families. And that includes um, everyone attached to the family, even you know, even our pets sometimes. Although I try not to keep, I try not to drift too far down the pet route. Um, although we all know sometimes they are our favorite children. But um, but yes, those kind of it's it, it's for me it's so amazing because it can be a very big problem or it can be just a small problem. I mean, often we just get asked, where can I go to renew my passport that's the least awful? I mean, that question pops up the whole the whole time. Um, and it can be from the hilarious, it's the combination of laughing and crying together and perhaps functioning in the way human beings are supposed to function, which is a mixture of big problem, small problem, laugh, cry, but just so long as our arms are outstretched. And what is interesting about the village is it really is not just one race, one color, or one creed. Um, you know, it's somewhere where we really find the stuff that unites us. Um, and it seems to be our desire to be better parents. The funniest of all, of course, is that I'm the most unpopular person amongst the um, teenage population of this country. They hate me. And whenever I meet them, I say, you should love me because the one thing that comes up in the, you know, you were saying, Sybil, about um, how, diff how it's changed, how parenting's changed. The one thing that comes up the whole time is about that we need to respect our children and listen to them and acknowledge them and trust them. All those things that we perhaps don't necessarily do because we weren't brought up that way. Um, but yet it doesn't work. I'm still dead. They think that the village is a horrible cult that basically polices their digital, um, their digital space and tells them to go to bed earlier than they would like and watches them with their girlfriend very cross about, um, about us. But I, I'm very confident. I think it's for the best. I believe we're helping. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else have anything to say? I just want to know how much time you spend each day because it takes a good deal of my day just going through all the <laughs> responses. You know, the thing is, it is like at the moment, it's um, a 24-7, 365. I don't, get a, I don't get a minute off. It's not even the day, it's the evening as well. Um, and if I wasn't building a business, I think I would have crashed. Um, but I'm so kind of proud of myself that next year I'm going to be hiring one assistant to help me um, so that I can kind of claw back a bit of control. Um, but it really is doing so well as a business as well. And FOMO is growing so beautifully. Um, and it's that... Um, it's kind of, you know, my father always said, you know, you know you, there's only blood, sweat and tears and time. That's what it takes to build a business. So this is, I think this is probably my last one. I don't think, in, I mean, I think in about um, 10 years I'll be done. I think this will keep me occupied for 10 years. And I think I'll be done in 10 years. So I'm in that growth period. And, and this is, I know this is what it takes. I'm, I'm not scared of hard work. And I think it's an amazing medicine, my mother has always said work is the best drug. Um, so yeah, but I'm not lying. It takes, it, it's, it's a non-stop day in, day out. It's no gig for us, for a, a um, you know, for someone with a weak stomach. <laughs> it is a lot of work. <laughs> oh, Could you tell you. us a little bit about FOMO? 
Yeah, FOMO is, um, so FOMO is a digizine. It is currently sent out to a subscription list of 15,000. We're, we're on issue eight at the moment. We've grew it from zero. So I'm really proud of that. I think um, it will just continue to grow. But the beauty of FOMO is it's the best of the village. So we um, curate content from each month of the village because Facebook doesn't allow you to see all the content. And a lot of people also feel, feel overwhelmed. So this is a digest of the best content. So it's from the village, for the village, by the village. Um, it's brilliant. It's like a self-edited, why wouldn't people love it? They made it themselves. And we already know which the subjects are, which people want to know more about because Facebook tells us that. So it's just, and you know, we, um, the personality of the thing is very much like the village. It's very um, positive and uplifting and entertaining. And so I'm so proud because it has, with subscriptions, subscription with news lists, um, newsletters in um, the, the industry at the moment, the average open rate, if you get a six or 7% open rate, um, you know, you're considered fair enough. If you get a 10% open rate, you're killing it. We have a 65% open rate and a 10 minute um, read time. So it's flying and um, I see only growth for FOMO and we're doing um, a festive foods for um, instant pot at the end of the year and we're doing a financial FOMO for um, Old Mutual also before the end of the year aimed at our age group, aimed at our particular, responding to our own community's particular needs. So it's something very unusual and new. It's a completely kind of unique way of creating content because it is so um, purposed towards the, um, the reader's interests and needs. And they also direct it. We respond to what the questions are and what the conversations are about. Excuse me, um, Vanessa, could you just give us um, an idea of how to, to, to sign up for so our members who really don't know how to do it? Um, oh my goodness, I should have been more prepared. Um, okay, can I, do you have a newsletter? Can I give you that? There's a, um, there's a URL, but um, okay. I would put have it to in find the chat. it. Put it in, oh, you, you don't want to put it in. All right, you can send it to me and then we can forward it out. That's, that's that would be wonderful. The more subscribers, the better. Very, okay. very happy. So for those of you who are interested, Vanessa will send us the URL. Um, Vanessa, just to tell you that when we went into lockdown, none of us knew about Zoom. And, and CJSA worked in the fact that we have five centers and we meet every week or every day at the centers. And we've got a various... Um, uh, activities that we do on, on a daily basis. And obviously all that stopped on the 27th of, of March last year. And we had to really think of how to keep everybody involved. And we started teaching people and ourselves how to get on Zoom. And we now have um, five days a week, at least once a day, something on and members can join in. And we have. I need you to teach me as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a learning curve for everybody, I think. Um, but it, we're so proud of our members because people who never thought that they'd be able to get onto Zoom are coming on daily and enjoying what we're doing. And we've got a Yiddish class every single Friday, and we're getting up to 50 people on the, the Yiddish class. That's so brilliant. Yeah. And, and, and you know, um, my, my mother in law, Shirley Stoltzman, she has been the queen of Zoom and of webinars, and she's better than all of us and knows more about all of us. Us. She hasn't been on us once. Oh, I need to, I'll nudge her. Yes, nudge her, <laughs> because she does, She has been to, to live things in the past. So, I'll um, nudge her. And she's got no pretty... excuse because she's a queen. She, <laughs> she can do all of it. Yeah. Well, so, I think, um, Jan, sorry, Philip? Anna, you might have to invite her to do a talk as well, and she'll definitely have to attend. Oh, no, my family don't Jan. need to listen to me. They've all heard it all before. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Hi, um, Diana, can you hear me? Yes, Philip. Hello, hi. You know, the thing, the important thing that uh, Vanessa brought up was people don't feel alone. And that is so important. And this is what I, you have to compliment Diana and her team for doing in creating this incredible series of events 
as, as Dan pointed out, every single day, something is happening and we are connecting all over the world right, with people actually from London and from Amsterdam and from, um, you know, all over the place coming in to some of the things we do. And it, it full credit for, to Diane and the team for making us not feel alone. We are part of a community and that what the organization was doing in actual meetings has continued through Zoom and having people like you come along and keeping us together. So thank you for being here and encouraging people to move with the times because change is the only thing that is constant. And as you have adapted along the way, uh, change is a, is a necessity. And I think it's an extraordinary tribute to everybody who's here that that's exactly what everyone has been doing and not feeling alone and remaining part of the community, the part of the seniors. It's so huge. thank you for what you're and, doing. And we Jewish people really know how to do that with experts. <laughs> Yeah. Really, Amanda, awesome. um, Amanda's put um, 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 something in the chat. What is that, Amanda? Amanda, unmute yourself. Yeah. It's for our concert today. Oh, the concert. Okay. The concert this afternoon is um, a Pavarotti a gala concert, and that's at two o'clock. So the web link is in the chat. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Anyone else has anything to say to Vanessa or ask any questions? We have time. <coughs> Hi, it's be here. Vanessa, thank you very much. I've got a lot of friends. We live in Cape Town now. I've got a lot of friends who are involved in the union and we so in Port Elizabeth, where we used to live. And they would just love to hear this talk of yours. Oh. Yeah, they, they're very <laughs> involved and they help many people and it was beautiful listening to you today. Yeah, my, my grandmother was, my grandmother was such, um, was so committed to the Union of Jewish Women and um, I miss her, I, I miss her to this day. I can't even really talk about her without um, tearing up. But it was a huge part of her life, and um, she was a huge part of it. So it's got a very special place in my heart. So Debbie, we have taped this morning. There is a link. There will be a link, and you can pass the link on to your friends in PE, and they'll be able to to log on and to hear the presentation. Oh, that's great! Thank you so much, Diana. I think Shirley uh, Alvey wants to speak. Yes, Shirley, I'm sorry, over to you. Shirley, like, like Debbie, uh, hi, uh, hi, all of you. Hi, Vanessa. I, I what, what I found most interesting about uh, seeing you today is the fact that I've got daughters in your age group and a son, and I think that they would well benefit from the contacts with the village because they're at work all day or whatever they're doing, and I think the opportunity to engage with people, especially in this time, would be very valuable for them. So thank you. Please encourage them to join. The more the merrier. You know, really together we only yeah. we are only more useful and more powerful. The, the the more we are. I will do exactly that. Thank you. Thanks, Shirley. <clears throat> Any other questions or statements? I'm so embarrassed. I'm not sure if you can hear my dog snoring. No, we can't. <laughs> it's, it's my friend. She who's sitting. My coworker is sitting on the on the beanbag next to me, snoring <laughs> so loudly throughout the whole thing. Well, obviously, he's very really comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Vanessa, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, we really do thank appreciate you, Diane. hearing. Thank you so much for doing. having me. And it just goes to show that, it, you know, anybody can reinvent themselves. You've just got to have the will to do it. And each one of us sitting here this morning, if you've got any idea, don't think it's stupid, put it to the test and see what you can do as well. It, it's just there for the asking. Um, so thank you for being with us, everybody. Uh, wishing you Shana Tova. Um, and hopefully you'll all have a meaningful and easy fast next week. But we will be sending out next week's links later on today. 
um, and join us this afternoon for this fabulous concert. Um, just thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everyone. And you'll send us a, you'll you. send me the email with the URL. I will. I will. I will. For sure. Thank you. Thanks,